Hello, this is Michelle Miller, and I am going to be lecturing on systems today. Um, first, the lecture is going to talk about generalized systems, and then we're going to talk about physical systems. And then this is going to be applied more broadly um, the rest of the quarter when we talk about biological systems. So in your textbook, they talk about systems as being collections of storages and flows. So the storages would be where materials and energy stay for an extended period of time. So this is where materials and or energy So for example, in previous lectures, we talked about carbon being stored in different areas, including rainforests, so it can be stored in vegetation, but carbon can also be stored in the ocean. And then for extended periods of time, it can be stored as fossil fuels. But we also have substances flowing, so we can talk about flows, and this is where we have the movement of materials and energy between the storages. So when we breathe out, for example, we breathe out carbon dioxide, and this is sending that carbon dioxide from our bodies, where it's been stored, out into the atmosphere. Also, like put between storages. Okay, so when we look at systems, they have patterns. And um, this, these patterns allow you to make some hypotheses or educated guesses as to um, what might happen. So for example, when we look at the hydrological cycle as a system, we can make some hypotheses as to what um, precipitation patterns are going to be. However, um, sometimes those um, systems have a stochastic property. So we can talk about the stochasticity or a stochastic variable. And this is um, a variable that is unknown or that um, uh, will change depending upon the other variables. So this has an element of uncertainty. So this, when we have stochastic variables, this can um, give you um, some problems when you're trying to make predictions. And so um, this could make um, the predictions harder to um, come by. And so obviously with our particular climate issues today, sometimes it's really hard to predict whether or not we're going to have excessive rainfall or drought because of the sto stochastic element, that there's an element of uncertainty. But this does not mean that the system is um, unpredictable in its entirety or if it's chaotic because there are certain things that govern systems. And so we can um, talk about um, whether or not um, systems have goals. So <clears throat> sometimes when we talk about biological systems, we talk about the goal of being able to survive and reproduce. So if we talk about biological systems, then we can talk about um, how um, uh, animals and other organisms behave in such a way to increase their survival and reproduction. So we'll say that organisms will behave in such a way to increase survival and reproduction. And so this is why sometimes we, when they say survival of the fittest, it's not entirely correct because sometimes we have traits that on the surface appear to be counter um, survival. So if we talk about like um, males fighting, that um, 
would maybe decrease their ability to survive, but it would increase their ability to reproduce. And so this is sometimes referred to as fitness. The combination of survival and reproduction is referred to as fitness. When we look at other systems, like social systems, like if we're looking at a culture, the goal here in a social system would be sustainability. Right. So if you're looking at a group of people, you want to be able to keep those people together. You want to keep them living in a way that they are not going to um, kill each other off, right? And they're going to have a, a sustainable um, system from one generation to the next. And when, then when we look at economic systems, they are generally based upon efficiency. So sometimes we use economic systems to study um, other animals besides our own. So for example, you could look at the foraging of an animal and you could say, is it efficient? So is the foraging of a lizard, is it efficient? And you would predict that efficiency would increase over generations because that is going to be able to increase their survival and their, um, their reproduction. Now, when we start talking about economics in terms of um, conservation biology and environmental science, sometimes we have problems because our economic systems do not take into consideration um, wastes and um, um, other things that they should take into consideration. And so we have a problem with measuring efficiency. Like the question is, in an economic viewpoint, the goal is to keep growing indefinitely but we know from a biological standpoint that growing indefinitely, like increasing our growth year after year is unsustainable. So this is just some examples of how systems have goals. Now it's important to realize that in terms of biological systems, organisms do not evolve towards an overall goal. So it's not that we're evolving towards having bigger brains, it just happens to be that um, brain size increased with humans. Um, but brain size is a trade-off like any other um, trait. And so brain size might not necessarily be good if you were talking about a lizard because they would have to expend too much energy on maintaining that nervous tissue. And so it's not that we're evolving towards a predestined plan. Um, which is um, important to realize when we're talking about living systems. Okay, so in living systems, oftentimes we talk about homeostasis, um, but we can also talk about it in terms of all systems. And um, what we see is, is that um, just kind of as a natural law, substances will tend to move from a state of low entrop entropy to a high entropy. So uh, it just doesn't like that area right there. I should just ignore that. So substances move from a higher concentration. So this would be low entropy because it's in, you know, it's more ordered to a lower concentration. And this would be high entropy. So entropy is just the measure of disorder which we've talked about previously. So this is to a lower concentration. And so you can just visualize, you know, um, if you had a beaker of water and you put a sugar cube in it, it would be very ordered to begin with because all the sugar would be um, centered in the center of the cube. And then as time progressed, just because molecular movement, not because of any energy uh, being put into the system, but the molecular movement would cause the, the particles to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So this is a, a diagram, for example, that shows that, right? And so um, in order to maintain order, like here, right, we have to put energy back into the system. So there's no way that we could actually take all of those sugar molecules and reconstitute them. We could dry them out and they would form crystals in the bottom of the beaker, for example. But um, there is some ways that we can um, move towards um, more order if we put energy into the system. 
Um, so homeostasis is actually a system's ability to maintain a storage or flow. So this is a system's ability to maintain a storage or flow. And um, this uh, uh, maintaining, this is called the set point. So it's really easy to see this in, a, in an organism if you're talking about temperature, because um, temperature is energy, and we need to maintain a set point of that temperature, okay? So um, if we get too hot, we want to get rid of heat by uh, evaporative cooling. If we get too cold, we want to shiver and cause our muscles to contract and to produce heat. So that would be an example. So when we look at um, systems and their ability to maintain the set point, we can talk about stability. And so stability is the resistance um, or the ability, actually, the ability to return to a set point. So ability to return to a set point. We have some other definitions I want to give you, which is resistance. So when we talk about a system, some systems are more stable. Some systems are more resistant, resistant to change. So this is the ability of the system to withstand disturbance. Ability of system to withstand disturbance. And then finally, we have resilience. So if change does happen, it's really important that the system is able to return to homeostasis. So this is the ability of the system to return to homeostasis. So when we look at um, ectotherms, they don't have a lot of stability. They are pretty much whatever their environment is. So if you look at a lizard, a lizard will be cold in the evening and hot during the day. But it does have a lot of resilience. And um, so um, it can withstand um, um, uh, different temperatures, right? And then it can use those temperatures and to maintain homeostasis. So if we look at some diagrams that show this, in your book, I think this might be helpful. So if we look at stability, this does not have a lot of stability. It will just change, right? We have as endotherms more stability because we are insulated. For example, we have fat that insulates us from temperature extremes, right? And we also use our metabolism to heat up our body temperature and we also sweat to cool us down. So this one has more stability because there's more resistance to change and it's going to tend to move back towards the set point, whatever that disturbance is. So if we look at, oops, I missed one, I think. Resistance, so that's the one that I missed. Okay, so resistance would be noticed that this is more resistant to change because this is a higher curve, right? So it is going to be more resistant to change. And this is going to be less resistant because it's going to take less energy to move this. And then resilience is a really cool one because resilience, like notice here, if we put a disturbance in there and it is so great, it's just balls is going to keep on rolling. It's not going to come back to its set point. And so um, a good example of this would be like, some ecosystems that once they are disturbed, it takes them a long time to come back. And so an example of this um, is the desert sometimes because there are these crusts on the desert that help to prevent erosion and they are actually made of microorganisms and they're called uh, biotic crusts. And so when you walk across them, you know, your tracks or let's say you ride your ATV across them, Sometimes it does permanent damage to those that those crusts that have been forming for 200 years. And so it's very hard for those um, 
for that to come back. And so we get a lot of erosion occurring in deserts where there's lots of disturbance. Okay, so in order to look at how systems uh, maintain um, homeostasis, we can talk about feedback. And so we can talk about negative feedback. So that's this place that doesn't look like it. Negative feedback. And this means that the response to the disturbance decreases the disturbance. So the response to the disturbance ultimately decreases the disturbance. And this is a good thing because then this helps to maintain the set point. Right. So, um, for example, if you um, release more CO2 in the atmosphere, um, there could be um, more plant growth, which is then going to decrease the CO2 in the atmosphere and try to maintain homeostatic balance. Okay. So the opposite of that is a positive feedback. And positive feedback mechanisms do not maintain homeostasis. Okay. So this means that the response to the disturbance increases the disturbance. So it has a positive effect. Okay. And so it's not, I think I mentioned this previously, but it's not a positive or being a good thing. In general, this will um, cause, um, will not maintain the set point. So it does not maintain the set point. Okay, so if we look at um, uh, the positive relationship between agricultural land and population, right? So as more people we get, um, the more agricultural land we have to produce, right? So that's a positive relationship. So um, if we look at it in terms of the amount of area, of forest area, this is human population decreases, has a negative effect on the forest area. So in our um, system here, we can see these are the, um, in the boxes, those are the storages, that's where the energy, and then these are the flows, so, or the relationships. And so the human population has an increase in um, agricultural land, increase in food supply, and this will just keep going, right, hopefully. Actually, that's a positive feedback, but it's a good thing. But we'll probably come up to a point where we don't have um, any more agricultural land and we might not be able to produce food. And then this is the negative, so negative. Um, so this is a negative relationship. So human population decreases forested land, right, which you have an increase in the wood supply and then an increase in human population. Okay, so there's a negative, this is actually, in order for this to be a negative feedback, you'd actually have, have to have a negative here. So if you had a decrease in the forested land, then you'd have a decrease in human population and we can maintain a steady population, maintain the set point. But this is an actually an example that has positive and negative relationships. Okay. So when we look at natural selection, we can talk about adaptations. So there we, the um, adaptations are the result of natural selection. And so it's important to realize that adaptations are any traits, or any trait that increases the probability that an organism will survive and reproduce. So the traits could be structural. So we could talk about um, thorns on plants. They could be physiological. We could talk about using metabolism to increase body temperature. 
They could also be behavioral. So we could talk about migration as a behavioral ad adaptation. Migration is really interesting because it's actually a flow. So if you think about birds migrating up north to lay their eggs, they're actually taking energy with them from their summer feeding grounds or from their winter feeding grounds, excuse me, and then going up north. And so they're actually um, moving um, energy in that direction, right? And the really interesting thing about behavior is this can also be learning. So learning could actually be, the ability to learn could actually be an example of an adaptation, okay? So adaptations are many things, and um, they are important in terms of biological systems. So if we look at why systems are hard to manage, okay, we already talked about one, and this is that sometimes they have an unpredictable behavior. So sometimes one, sometimes there is unpredictable behavior. Okay, so this could be due to a stochastic variable, which is hard to to determine. So like the amount of rainfall sometimes in when you're making plans <clears throat> about like, for example, what to plant. We try to make predictions about the rainfall and when rainfall will happen, but sometimes the rain just does not come. And so then you get um, drought and you get crop failures and then that can lead to decrease in food supply, which can also lead to erosion and all kinds of things. So maybe rainfall would be a good example in the agricultural system, which would be a, um, uh, um, a problem. And um, sometimes with this idea, let me just go back up here. Sometimes with this idea, we have what is called risk management. So this is still under number one. So um, using that example that I gave before, um, sometimes it um, means that you have to make um, plans, right? If your crop fails, what are you going to do? So um, could be in the United States that you take out insurance policy, right? And you, you have, if your crop fails, you still get some money because you are insured. Okay, so we can also talk about, um, we have the complexity. So when we increase the numbers of storages and flows and feedback loops, um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, when we increase the number of feedback loops um, and storages, then it becomes really complex and it's really hard to, um, to make some predictions about that. The third thing would be that there's a hierarchy, right? So we could talk about um, populations, but when we look at um, populations, those are individuals of a given species. And then the next level is community. And then the next level is ecosystem. Okay, so population would be like a population of a single species, but there, um, their uh, population growth might be dependent upon their prey and also their predators, so the community and what they eat, for example. And then the, this is um, just the living stuff, but then the ecosystem includes temperature and rainfall and other things that influence um, salinity, pH, right? And so that's the, the biotic and the abiotic components. And so if you're trying to just look at a population, then you realize, oops, my population is dependent upon predators, then I have to take into consideration the community. So that creates problems. And then we have, sometimes we have time lags. And this means that um, a change in one variable um, does not have an immediate effect. And so there is a, um, a period of time between, maybe a long period of time, maybe years, between the cause and effect. So, um, a long period of time oops 
so, you know, um, a good example of this is climate change, because in the 90s, when I was going to um, school, university, um, in like 1991, we were talking about climate change and, um, you know, uh, and being really concerned about it. But it's now, you know, 20 years later and uh, not a lot has happened, but we're now starting to see the effects of the accumulation. Um, and so we're starting to see some of the changes. The fifth thing would be distance effects. And this is the idea that something that happens far away can actually influence your system. So we talked about how um, <clears throat> phosphorus can actually flow in the air from Africa to South America and influence plant growth in the Amazon, right? So this is the idea is that, that things from uh, far away can actually have an effect on a system that we don't even realize. And some of the interesting ones that are popping up today are pollution. So we're producing pollutants in the industrial world and they're actually um, going in the atmosphere to the poles. And then you have these indigenous people in the poles that are starting to see in their own tissues and their own bodies, the accumulation of these toxins that they have never produced, but they were produced in the industrial world and they're starting to accumulate in the polar regions of our planet. And so that would be a good example of a distance effect. So this shows complexity, quite a bit of complexity. This is the example of Eastern Island. And then hierarchy, time legs, here I'm gonna show you time legs, okay. So this would be the upwind sulfur emissions um, and notice how it took quite a few years from starting in 1880, where we finally see in 1960, a dramatic decrease in the, in the pH of the lake. And so um, that accumulation of sulfur dioxide combining with water caused sulfuric acid. So that would be an example of a um, time lag um, consisting of many decades. And then this is also example of distance effects. So if we look at where the um, um, emissions are, then we can see um, where the pH is ending up. And so um, emissions from one place can actually um, have their effect in a, a place that is from far away. So, and obviously pollutants don't follow any kinds of um, um, boundaries um, in terms of um, from one nation to the other political boundaries. Okay. So that's just the generalized idea of systems. Um, and there is a big, a big um, approach to um, moving away from what is called reductionist science to more of a systems approach. So even in things like medicine. So reductionism is breaking things down into its components to study them. So breaking things down into their smallest component to understand them. Okay, so example would be like if you were talking about a species. So if we're talking about an endangered species, like maybe um, polar bears, right? Um, if you're just going to study their species um, and you're just going to conserve the species, how are you going to do that without looking at the system in which they are a part of? So systems are looking at, at um, the species within the context of the ecosystem. So there's actually a big, uh, a big push to not conserve species per se, but to conserve whole ecosystems. So like, okay, we want to uh, preserve um, the temperate rainforest. We don't want to just preserve spotted owls, right? Because when you preserve the temperate rainforest, you preserve all the other animals that are necessary to preserve the, the big species that um, we um, feel emotional about, okay? So this is reductionism. So the systems is looking at the big picture. So this would be the big picture. And we just talked about how sometimes that is difficult because of stochastic variables, because of complexity, the amount of variables that are interacting, 
and because of um, we talked about complexity hierarchy right so even in um, medicine for example instead of just looking at the digestive system as being separate from all the other systems there's a big push now to look at how the digestive system is related to the nervous system so um, sometimes when you have digestive issues it could affect your mood also looking at the immune system because we're seeing that the digestive system has its own immune system and sometimes in Crohn's and celiac disease that goes awry and the immune system attacks the digestive system. So instead of just looking at the individual components of our bodies, we now wanna look at it as a holistic. And you know, um, Eastern cultures and indigenous cultures are more prone to looking at holistic systems than Western sciences. Western science has been very powerful because it's reduced everything down to its smallest component. But we realize now that we need to start putting things together. But putting two things together, we're not really good at understanding that. And we see that big time now in terms of ecology. OK, so we're going to talk about physical systems. And so um, the first thing we're going to talk about is solar energy. because this is where we get the vast majority of our energy for running our systems on our planet. So this is the ultimate source of energy for most organisms on the planet. Now a few, we'll talk about this, but a few um, that live really in the deep oceans are dependent upon energy that's coming from the center of the planet. So the center of the planet has radioactive um, elements in it that are releasing heat and heat is coming out from the center and radiating out, okay? So this is work. So solar energy can do work. Right, it can help to, um, to maintain systems. And so if we look at um, the um, solar energy, um, we can see how much of it actually makes it to the surface and how much of it is radiated back out. So when we look at average across the whole globe, about 21% of this energy is reflected by the clouds. So we all know this, that clouds um, would decrease primary production. So if you have a really cloudy summer, um, then the, you might your plants might not grow as much because there's not a much, as much light coming in. And so this can have a dramatic effect on um, climate change. And there's even some idea of uh, creating more clouds um, in hopes of cooling the planet off as kind of um, a possible solution to climate change. So when we look at this, um, we see that the um, solar energy coming in, some of it is scattered by clouds, some of it is um, absorbed by um, dust, um, but only about 48% of it um, actually reaches the surface and is used. So when we look at um, the way that solar energy can be used, we can see that we can talk about um, the ways that it is used. And so we could talk about the hydrological cycle. So 18% of the solar energy that comes into the planet is used to cause water to be evaporated. And it drives uh, the formation of clouds and subsequent precipitation. And then we have atmospheric circulation, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. And this is about 1.4% of that energy coming in. And then just a tiny fraction of the energy that makes it um, to the surface of the planet is used by plants to produce chemical energy during photosynthesis. So it's about 0.4%. And so this is really small, if you think about it, um, when we think about that energy being used. So in your book, they have this diagram that shows 50% of it is converted to heat. Heat tends to be low quality. 18% runs the, um, the water cycle. 
um, we're talking about the atmosphere and the, and the movement of water, and then 30% is reflected back. Okay, so that's solar energy. Only about 0.4% of that energy is incorporated into plants, and so that would be photosynthesis. Okay, so the other source of energy is the Earth's core. So we have radioactive minerals. for example, like uranium. These release heat, so this causes a release of heat, of energy, and the heat, um, the, the center of our planet is actually um, liquid, right? And the heat um, moves out to the surface. So the heat moves from center outward. Heat always flows from a high concentration, more molecular, to a lower um, mole molecular movement. So it moves from center outward. And if we think about this, this can actually um, cause plate tectonics. So this is the movement of continents. So at one point in time, our continents actually were fitted together and then into a big mass called Pangaea. And then Pangaea caused um, the continents to, um, not Pangaea, but the um, plate tectonics caused the continents to move, to drift apart. So you have continental drift. And then we have these rifts where um, new um, mountains are being built. So this energy can come up to the surface and cause volcanic um, eruptions, and it can also cause um, um, it can also cause earthquakes. Okay, so um, this um, forms this energy forms new crusts. So think Hawaii, right? It is a volcanically formed um, island. So it causes volcanoes. I don't know if there's an E. I think there's an E on that one. And then this also um, heats ocean waters. This is the energy. And so these are called thermal vents. Okay. So this energy from inside the planet does do some work. Okay. And maybe this would be also building mountain ranges, like the Cascades. Okay. And the separation or the coming together of plates can cause earthquakes. Okay. Okay, so when we look at physical systems, such as um, the movement of the atmosphere or the movement of the water, we're gonna talk about what are, what are referred to as convection cells. Convection cells explain um, the movement in the atmosphere as well as the water as it um, causes um, the liquid or the gas to um, um, flow in a particular direction. So the convection cell is just the movement of gas or liquid due to the application of energy. That's the definition. So this is the movement of gas or liquid due to the application of energy. And you can see this in your own kitchen when you boil water. As the um, water molecules heat up, they become less dense, and so they actually rise to the surface. And so at the surface, um, then they move horizontally, and then they um, uh, cool off, and then they um, fall. So if this is my heat, right? So my water tends to heat up, and it rises to the surface, decrease in the density, and then it kind of moves along the surface. Ooh, it loses some of the heat to the atmosphere and then it falls back down. And so you get this convection, this movement of water. 
And this is the way um, when we talk about solar energy, when the solar energy hits our planet, it's greatest um, um, at the equator. And it actually causes the atmosphere to create these convection cells, which cause our um, the atmosphere um, the patterns that we know, like storminess over the equator and then bands of deserts further north and south to occur. So in your book, they have this diagram that shows the convection cells, right? Okay, that's the convection cell. And so here, um, what we have is, is the low pressure as the air in the equator rises and it's very, very, um, as it rises, it cools. And so it has, um, um, it creates lots of clouds. And so you get lots of rain at the equator. And then as it flows over here, it dries out and then it comes back down, right? And then comes back in. And so this, these um, convection cells can explain the patterns of precipitation and also movement of water. Um, what we see along the whole planet. So there's actually three uh, convection cells each side of the equator. You don't need to know these names, but it also causes the flow. And so at the equator, um, what tends to happen is, is that the, we get um, air flowing from um, the east to the west at the equator. It's flowing in this direction, okay? And then um, here, it comes back down, right? And it tends to flow from west to east in this direction. And so you can see um, along the equator, um, um, the flow of the water and the air. You could also see that this pattern right here means that it doesn't flow in a straight line. So what we see here is, is that the, um, because of the Coriolis effect, which is the rotation of the planet, that we see um, that the air and the, uh, and the water do not tend to move in a straight line, but rather they tend to bend just because of the surface of the planet being a sphere. Okay, okay so if we look at, um, the um, physical properties of water as it relates and why is it important um, for precipitation in the atmosphere system, okay? Um, we can say that the water heats up and cools down less rapidly than land. What that means is, is that it stores energy. Right, so we have a lot of storage of energy in water. And then we can also say that the sun penetrates the water more deeply, that it penetrates the land crust, okay? So sunlight, sunlight penetrates water more deeply than land. And so what we see here is, is that there's layers of water and they can mix. So can kind of actually mix easily, right? So if you think about it, winds can sometimes, or waves can sometimes move the water and help to mix it. Whereas if you're thinking about land, when the sun heats up the land, there's no mixing, like right? so, when you're digging down in your garden and you go get down and it gets colder and colder and colder as you go, right? There's not a lot of mixing, but in the water, um, physical things like um, waves and even upwelling due to the convection currents can um, cause cold water, cold deep water to come up and warm or cool down, excuse me, cool down the warm water on top, okay? So that's another thing that's important.
And then water's density is dependent um, on temperature, but it is actually less dense as a solid. So I'll just put water is less dense as a solid than a liquid. Oops. Okay, so this means that ice floats, and this is really significant, because if you think about it, um, generally most things, um, when they solidify, they become more dense. But in this case, the water molecules actually space themselves further apart and they become a solid. And so the ice will float. And so bodies of water will freeze from the top down instead of from the bottom up. So bodies of water freeze from top down. So this means that ice can insulate the water underneath. And perhaps the whole river or stream or pond will not freeze solid. So ice can insulate water. So maybe the river freezes, but there's still moving water underneath it. Maybe the pond freezes, but the animals underneath the ice still survive over winter. Okay. So those are some characteristics that make um, that are important in um, understanding the physical systems of water. Okay. So temperature profile, I'm gonna kind of go fast here. The temperature profile generally in a lake, <coughs> you can see the thermocline is where the change in water happens rapidly. And so um, it's kind of interesting because um, water will change temperature rapidly and then this is less rapid so this is a steeper slope so this is a more rapid change in water and that's important when we get to um, aquatic biomes we'll talk about that thermocline okay so let's talk about patterns physical systems of air water and earth so <clears throat> when we look at um, air we can talk about um, precipitation in the atmosphere. So the movement of the atmosphere. And patterns of precipitation. So the equator, in the equator, we see that um, precipitation is greater than evaporation. So it rains a lot, and so it rains more than water is evaporated. And so this would, for example, create tropical rainforests. So one of the interesting thing about tropical rainforests is, is that they generally are warm, but they're not really that hot because it kind of, it gets hot maybe during the morning and then the clouds form and then it rains and it cools everything back down. So they're not as hot, tropical rainforests, they're, they're more humid, so they feel hotter to us, but they're not as hot as say some of the deserts. And then if we look at 30 degrees, um, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, we see deserts. And this is where evaporation exceeds precipitation. Right? And it can get really hot in the desert. Um, generally, it cools off at night really fast because there's not a lot of clouds. When you look at tropical rainforests, they stay warm all the time. Okay, so that's an example of air. And then we can look at water. So water, when we talk about the water, we can talk about ocean circulation. And this is due to ocean surface winds. 
and they kind of transfer um, some of the energy to the um, water to cause them to flow in a particular direction. And so, <clears throat> for example, at the equator, we have what are called easterlies. So this is means that um, the um, air moves from the east towards the west. So the east towards the west. And we do not see easterlies where we live. We have westerlies. So if we look at um, between 30 degrees and 60 degrees, north and south, that's the latitude. So we're going moving towards the poles. Then we have westerlies. So we see westerlies. So the um, movement of water and air goes from the west and then goes to the east. So that's why uh, clouds and rain come on upon us on the Pacific coast and then they move towards the east coast. Okay. Now, um, ocean circulation does not um, um, flow in a straight line but rather it curves just like the um, air with the, Corio or the Coriolis effect, the, the curving. And then it also, when it hits a land mass, it will sometimes start to circle. And so if we look at, um, oops, diagrams of this. <coughs> Notice east to west. Notice west to east, kind of a general, okay? And then we can look at the circulation. And so notice how with us, for example, water comes down and it actually is coming kind of down from high up and down. And so this actually brings cold water. So if you think about like, if you've ever swam off the coast of California, the ocean water is much cooler than off the, coast, the um, ocean in Florida. And that's because water is coming this direction and coming down, but in Florida, it's actually coming up. And so this movement of water is sometimes referred to as the global conveyor belt. So this is the global conveyor belt. And this is um, movement of water, not air, but the movement of water. And so it also has to do with salinity and um, uh, the movement. So, for example, we see <clears throat> that um, the cold water, and this is so. This is just like your coffee pot, right? The cold water sinks to the bottom, and then as it warms up and moves up here, it rises to the top, right? And so, notice here. Show you here, right? So this this would be a, a conveyor belt that is going to keep um, Europe relatively warm. <coughs> so. There's been some concern that this conveyor belt might um, slow down of bringing warm air to Europe. If you think about Europe, Europe is much warmer than um, North America, the equivalents of North America, but in North America, it's a little bit cooler. I kind of made a mess of that. But this is the global conveyor belt and just shows the flow of water <coughs> along the continents. Okay. So El Nino is a weather event that is rather unusual, although we've had some seen some extended periods of El Nino recently. So this is where um, specifically trade winds that, that move slow down and there's decreased movement of warm water away from South America, the Pacific coast of South America, and the Pacific coast of North America. <coughs> Excuse me. Decreased movement of warm water away from North and South America. And there's a video that goes along with this. Um, in your um, um, lecture area that I'd like you to watch that shows this. 
So what normally happens is, is that these trade winds blow, and so notice this is the warm water, specifically in Peru, but also like off the coast of, of um, <clears throat> North America, they blow, right? And if we get weakened trade winds, <coughs> then um, this warm water starts to accumulate here, and that brings really wet weather. So the wet, rainy weather that we, we see um, because of um, uh, to this year is because of El Nino. But the problem is, is that the water is hot. So it can actually, it's causing problems um, with coral bleaching, for example, in the Caribbean, because the, wa the warm water stays there even um, when it um, moves away. And so um, what also happens is you, that you get, oops, excuse me, you get a decrease in the upwelling. So under normal years, we want cold water to upwell here, and the cold water actually contains a lot of nutrients. And so fisheries rely upon this upwelling, and so during El Nino, there's no cold water upwelling, and so this poses a problem for um, fish. It also poses a problem for large organisms like whales because they are also dependent upon that um, food chain that goes from um, <clears throat> the, the phytoplankton and then to the algae and then to the krill and like the baleen whale is dependent upon being able to scoop up large quantities of krill and um, use them um, as energy. And so upwelling reduces the productivity, or upwelling increases the productivity. So when we have El Nino, um, it is, oops, this is El Nino. We have reduced upwelling, and so we have reduced productivity. OK, so that's the movement of water. And then finally, I mentioned that the Earth does move. And so um, this is Pangea. Um, and notice how over time we see that it has, um, the continents have separated. And we also um, see that there are plates and there's still movements. And so some of these plates um, are going to cause earthquakes. And so there's a big concern that there's a Pacific plate. The movement of that is going to cause an earthquake on the Pacific coast. Okay. And then we can see the rock cycle. So this is... Um, how rocks are formed from magma that comes up, right? And um, we have the development of new crusts, even in the ocean. And so the ocean covers a large part of our planet, but underneath the ocean are mountain ranges, there's valleys, there's trenches, there's all kinds of really interesting geological structures under the ocean. And um, National Geographic did an interesting um, story on this recently because it was a woman scientist who first proposed that there was interesting geological features on the ocean floor and people did not believe her and then she came, turned out to be correct. So when we look at the rock cycle, <clears throat> we see that um, rocks can actually undergo melting Right? and then they can actually turn into a liquid, and then they can be forced back up by volcanic action, so we can get um, volcanic rocks to be formed, and then rocks can be broken back down, right? So we can have um, um, weathering of the rocks, and it can be tr transport, uh, transported um, by wind, so wind can actually carry rock in the form of dust and it can deposit it, and then that whole cycle can begin again. So I'd like you to read about the rock cycle in your, um, in your textbook. Okay, so that has to do, that's the end of the physical systems. So the next lecture, we're gonna take this idea of systems and flows and energies, and then we're gonna talk about the different biomes that we see on our planet because of the different atmospheric and um, precipitation and water, um, the different flows of energy.